I'm going to go ahead and welcome up Dr. Davi Ortega from Caltech's Jensen Lab. Thank you, Davi. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a truly fantastic event. I think we're all very honored uh, to be here and to be able to share this with all of you. So I'm going to go back a little bit. And uh, so the story here goes, my, my talk is a little bit about this experimenting, sharing scientific data. In this case, uh, electron cryotomograms, uh, this in creating a, a tomography database with it. So if you guys don't know what a cryo-electron tomogram is, so you take a little sample of some bacteria, and then you put in a little grid, and then this little robot uh, will uh, dry it up a little bit, take the excess of the water, and plunge, free, plunge it into a mix of propane ethane uh, ultra cold. So it just, just freezes on the spot. It doesn't allow the cells to explode. This technique won the Nobel Prize uh, last year. So then we take this little grid and put them in a little uh, cartridge that we insert that into an electron microscope. And what we do, basically, we take uh, projection uh, pictures of it. So each one of these projection pictures in different angles. So we get like different uh, views of this uh, particular grid. And with this, we assemble into what we call tilt series. So this is a real data called uh, from a Bidello Vibrio cell. So it's basically like several different tilt series. And using that, we use computer programs to calculate uh, what we call a reconstruction. So this is a 3D reconstruction of the Bidello Vibrio cell. And the amount of sheer, sheer amount of information in each one of these data sets is absurd. We take one of those, or thousands of those, for one specific part of it. But there's all the information about the rest of the cell. For example, here, I'm going to say a bunch of names. You guys go follow along with me. But you have the outer membrane, the inner membrane, the cell wall. You have the nucleoid, ribosomes, flagella motor. Then you have type 4 secretion cyst, uh, type 4 pili. Then you have chemoreceptors and many other organelles. All of that in the same cell. And when you're just using like a few pixels of it. So you can literally make an entire uh, visualization of this cell in a 3D model. Well, uh, my boss one day walked into the lab and said, like, I think it's a little wasteful that we keep tens of thousands of tomograms in the basement. So let's uh, share with the public. So he came to me and said, like, hey, how can I share 10,000 tomograms, 30 terabytes of data in multiple different formats in a cool way? <laughs> that was the key part. So at this point, I was um, interested in different types of uh, uh, sharing uh, possibilities. And the first, the obvious answer for this is basically you put your files in the RAID 6 system, you put your metadata in a SQL database, you build an API, and then the users have to interact with that data via the API you build. But that has some problems. In academia, any sort of powerful server might be prohibitive because of costs. Uh, there's a problem of data segregation. So if everybody starts to uh, put their data in their own server, now the user needs to go to each one of the labs, the website, and then collect the data they're interested in. And there's a problem of data persistency. So if a lab like this lose funding, for example, the data might be inaccessible or even lost. To solve all that, we are to try to solve all that, this is an experiment, uh, we build a TDB that stands for Electron Tomography Database. The Electron Tomography Database used, as Devon said, used two uh, pieces of technology use the IPFS and the Flow blockchain ledger. And we use OIP, OIP to communicate with these um, two technologies. So basically, our tomography lab has a server. It takes our files and put in the IPFS, take the hash, put in the metadata, and put in the Flow um, blockchain. The users now can consume our data by not searching or looking to, at our server, but simply by looking at the metadata, the Flow blockchain, and at the PFS. Well, this is not very uh, much difference than the regular database scheme. It gets more interesting when you have multiple labs contributing to the data. So they can all write permissionlessly, I can't believe I pronounced that word right, uh, <clears throat> to the blockchain and, and to the PFS. And now the users can go to these two resources and collect the information from all the labs in the world, making almost as a central 
the repository, but it's decentralized and without, uh, you don't need to ask permission for anybody. It gets even more interesting because now, because of the nature of IPFS and the Flow blockchain, you can have independent websites that are particular for a specific species or for a certain type of like feature in the organelle, and they specialize into make certain type of treatment of the data. For example, segmentation of the membrane, which it means I'm trying to find the limits of the cell in each one of the stomograms programmatically. Um, well, we are in, in the middle of this, and I will tell you which stage we are in this uh, experiment, but <coughs> we created one of these uh, little websites to display uh, the data that we put in, which now has over 10,000 tomograms. So this is the front end of uh, the etdb.caltech.edu. And if you go in, you can click it like browse database, you go to a grid like, and by the way, this is interesting. So this is real time because it's loading 11,000 tomograms, the metadata of 11,000 tomograms. But uh, we are very, uh, we asked the Alexandra team to help us out and they implement Elasticsearch. So now this actually is gonna be much faster in a little bit. So once you find a tomogram that you like, you click in and then you see one of these videos uh, that I show you in the beginning. And then you can also have like access to snapshots that we made in the lab while we're doing research with a little description about what they are. And then you have a download table where you can download into one of the individual files. <clears throat> so we expect that this kind of system not only gonna empower the scientists that now can use this to help their research. These data sets are really expensive. One cryo-electron microscope costs $7 million. So it's not a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of places that can have one of those. Uh, I actually, I think below the equator, very few places have. So this gives them access to 10,000 tomograms that uh, they didn't have. Okay, so the next steps for ETDB, because now we need to convince other labs to put they, their data using this uh, implementation. And I've already, we already implemented Caltech, and we are in talks uh, with the Penn State and uh, UPenn, Imperial College, and University of Leiden uh, to put their data in. The next thing we need to do is to take our website and make a vanilla version of it. So people can literally just fork the repository, change the colors, and now they can use to display their own data. And we want to use the IPFS, uh, the JS, a JavaScript implementation of IPFS. So we don't need to run or you know, spin your own node. You can just look at the browser. And if anybody wants to help with that, very, very uh, wanted. <laughs> Just communicate with us because we, we were having some trouble. Uh, we need, there are some central repositories of this data. There are things called EMDB or NPR that uses like pentabytes of data of cryo-electron tomography submitted by other uh, institutions. So we want to get them on board of ETDB also because for them it doesn't need to change anything. It's just need to run a program and it's not extra resources. We already uh, start the talks with them, and it seems promising. And finally, uh, the next thing is to fork the ETDB React vanilla and make the ETDB world, which basically collects the data from all the labs all together. So I think this is a quite interesting experiment, most because, mostly because it achieved the goal that we wanted, and also we had a deadline, and this entire thing was building less time that took to negotiate <laughs> what would need to be in or out the programs. So it was like roughly a month or three weeks of work and, and it was really, really quick. Most be, mostly because OIP is such a great tool and easy to use. Like the barrier to enter this ecosystem was really, really low. So, oh yeah, help wanted just one more time. So if you, <laughs> if you guys know anybody, please contact us, we would really, really appreciate. Uh, this is the team that put this thing together. So Grant is my boss, the, the Jensen lab where I work, then Jane uh, and Catherine are two people from the lab that helped write the papers and pick the tomograms and so on. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, Ryan, and Sky, Devon and Amy are from the Alexander team, and Prue is the graphic designer that designed the website uh, for us.